Hello and welcome back to the alphabet of astronomy. Today it's brought to you by the letter O and O is for opacity. <laughs> So we generally think of space as being very transparent. After all, we can see stars that are millions of miles away, and we know that space is basically a vacuum. There's just not very much stuff in it. It's pretty empty. But in fact, not all of space is exactly transparent, and the measure of that not transparency is what we call opacity. So basically how opaque something is. And this actually turns out to be a very important concept in astronomy. So for one thing, the space between stars is not actually empty. There's something called the interstellar medium, and this is the gas and dust that's located between stars. Now the ISM is not very dense at all. In fact, the densest and coldest parts of the ISM have a density that's about 13 orders of magnitude less than typical air here on Earth. But even this very sparse material has some opacity. And this can have important effects. For example, when we see a star that's far away, it looks dimmer because it's farther away, but it also looks dimmer because of the opacity of the interstellar medium between us and that star. And if we don't know how much of the dimming is due to opacity rather than distance, it can lead to difficulties in measuring distances. Opacity can also reveal structures such as dark nebula. For example, there's a beautiful nebula called Barnard 68, which is a dust cloud that has a temperature of about 8 to 16 Kelvin. Very cold. And while it looks like this super dense black thing, it actually has a density of less than a million atoms per cubic centimeter, which is about equal to what would be considered an ultra-high vacuum chamber here on Earth. But of course, it's not just the space between stars that has opacity. After all, something has to be opaque in order for us to see it, and so objects themselves have opacity, especially, for example, stars. And this opacity actually governs how far into a star we can see. So what we consider the surface that we're seeing is actually based on the opacity of that star. Because if it was more opaque, we would see less further into it. Does it, that make sense? <laughs> so the more, the less opacity something has, the farther into it you can see, or that is the greater optical depth it has. And it's not just stars. In fact, the universe itself was opaque at some point. And the remnants of this opaque universe is what we call the cosmic microwave background. And this is why we can't see any further back past the CMB or the surface of last scattering, because the universe was opaque. The opacity was just too high. Planets have opacity too. And in fact, given the differentiated nature of something like a terrestrial planet and the atmosphere that sits on top of it, which have very different opacities, if you think about how far you can see through the Earth's atmosphere versus how far you can see through the Earth itself. And we can actually use this varying opacity of the atmosphere to study the atmospheres of exoplanets when we can't even see the planets themselves, but we can see how the opacity of those planets affects the light from the star. And that's one way that we can get compositions for exoplanet atmospheres. So opacity can be really important for objects. Now the basic concept of opacity or something being opaque is basically how much light does it block? And we tend to think of this as kind of a brightness scale, right? So something that is more opaque is going to block more light. It's going to, light is going to appear dimmer if it passes through it, or something that's less opaque is going to appear brighter when light passes through it. And this sort of overall intensity or brightness is a opacity, and we call this a mean opacity because it's basically how much all of the wavelengths of light are being affected by the opacity. But opacity doesn't have to be a continuum opacity. It doesn't have to cover all wavelengths of light. And depending on the source of the opacity, it can actually be very specific to certain wavelengths of light. And so only narrow bands may be blocked or only narrow bands may be let through. For example, that interstellar dust that we talked about tends to be more opaque at shorter wavelengths. And so that means that it blocks bluer light preferentially and lets through more redder light. And so light that passes through that appears redder to us. So not only is it dimmer, not only is the overall brightness being reduced because the amount of photons is less, but the photons that we are getting have a different characteristic wavelength than they would, be, would have without that um, dust in the middle. We can also see this in the Earth's atmosphere. So the opacity of the Earth's atmosphere actually varies very significantly with wavelengths. So at visible light, the light that we see and detect with our eyes, the atmosphere is very low opacity. It's very transparent. And this is not a coincidence. It makes sense that life would evolve to have sensory organs that take advantage of the light that can actually pass through the atmosphere from the sun. Although I'm not a biologist, so I'm probably missing some nuance there, but that's, that's the general idea as far as I understand. 
But for example, the opacity at infrared wavelengths, which are these longer wavelengths, is actually quite high. And so this means, this is kind of how greenhouses work, right? They let in optical light because they're transparent in the optical wavelengths. And then once that light is absorbed by the material inside the greenhouse or inside the Earth's atmosphere, it re-radiates light back out based on its temperature. This is called black body emission. And that light is usually typically at longer infrared wavelengths. Think about how night vision works, right? You're seeing infrared light that's being emitted based off the heat of people or objects. But this light is much better at being blocked by either the material of the greenhouse or the Earth's atmosphere. And so this helps keep the Earth warm, which is a good thing when we don't want to be a you know ice ball, but it's a bad thing when uh, we're kind of pumping up that opacity in some of these wavelengths uh, by introducing things like carbon dioxide into the air, which increases the opacity to these infrared wavelengths and helps trap heat here on Earth. And these bands of transparency in the Earth's atmosphere also relate to the sort of astronomy that we can do. So from the ground, radio waves, which radio is just a very long wavelength of light, um, can pass quite easily through the atmosphere. And in fact, they, they can pass through clouds and everything. So, you know, invisible light, if it's a cloudy night, we can't really observe. But in radio, you can observe in a cloudy night, no fine. And so radio um, observatories work very well from the ground. However, at certain wavelengths like x-rays um, or infrared, you really can't do that much from the ground and you have to go into space. You have to be above the atmosphere to really be able to actually observe in these wavelengths. So that's the general idea of opacity, but what is actually happening? What is opacity? Where does it come from? Well, what's actually happening is that the photons are interacting with matter. And this can basically remove photons from a beam of light that's passing through a, a material. So opacity is measured usually in meters squared per kilogram. So this is basically what we call a cross-section or an area for some interaction to happen and then per mass of the material. Now this is part of a topic that's known as radiative transfer, and that gets kind of not so fun in the details, and so I'm not going to really get into that here, but this is where we're coming from and the basic idea of what we're talking about. So you have a light beam coming through, photons coming through a material, not all of those photons are going to get to the other side, and the amount that doesn't get to the other side is basically this opacity. That's how much it's reduced by. And in general, there are four different types of interactions that can happen between these photons traveling through the material and the material itself. And they pretty much are all involving electrons. So the first is what we call bound-bound transitions. And so when we say bound, we're talking about the electron. So in this case, you have an electron that's bound to you know, a nucleus that's part of a larger structure. And an incoming photon interacts with that electron and gives its energy to the electron, exciting the electron into a higher energy state, but still within that atom. So it's still bound. That's why it's a bound-bound interaction. It starts bound and it ends bound, but it just changes um, the energy levels. Now in an atom, those energy levels are discrete. There's a given energy and another given energy. So this can only happen, this type of interaction can only happen for photons that have that exact energy. That's the difference between those two energy levels. And so for this reason, bound-bound transitions only happen at certain wavelengths because the wavelength um, governs the energy of a photon. And so you really get a discrete opacity um, at different wavelengths with these kinds of bound-bound transitions. On the other hand, you can have something called a bound-free absorption. So again, we're talking about the electron, and the, again, just like with bound-bound, the electron starts bound to an ion um, or an atom, but this time it absorbs a photon that has enough energy to totally remove it from all of the energy levels. It's basically more energy than even the highest energy level that's still bound to that atom. And so it frees the electron, and the electron goes off to become a free electron. And so because it's not just a discrete step between energy levels, this can happen with really any wavelength of photon as long as it has enough energy to get to that point. So basically up to a certain point, there's no interactions and then past that point, you get a continuum, what we call continuum opacity from these sorts of bound free absorptions. But then again, you can have what is called free free absorption. And as again, you might guess, we're talking about the electron here. And so the electron this time is going to be a free electron. So it's not bound to anything. It's a free electron. It's going to absorb a photon and it's still going to be a free electron when it's done just with more energy. So free free absorption. And um, because you're not moving between energy levels, again, this is going to be a continuum and there's no minimum energy here because you're not starting from any sort of bound state. So the um, the electron just absorbs the photon, gets a little bit more excited, gets a little bit more energy, and you get continuum opacity. And lastly, we have electron scattering. So now an electron scattering, basically, instead of being absorbed by the electron, the photon just interacts with the electron and they kind of deflect off of each other and they scatter. 
So if you have this sort of scattering off of a free electron, that's called Thomson scattering. And Thomson scattering is very difficult to do because the cross-section for this interaction, or the basically the target area for this interaction, is very, very small because electrons are tiny, right? And so this only happens pretty much in scenarios um, where you have a lot of free electrons and basically no bound electrons. So something that's going to be really hot and ionized like plasma of stars. So it's a very quick and brief introduction to a topic that you might not have thought about, but it's actually really important in astronomy. After all, we can only learn things about the universe from what we see. And up until very, very recently, we could only see things via photons. Now we can also use gravitational waves, which is super exciting. But photons have to get to us. And so we have to know about the ways that photons might not get to us in order to really understand the incoming light. And so opacity is super important in astronomy. I hope you learned a little bit more about it. I hope you enjoyed. And of course, I hope you will come back for the letter P. Thanks for watching. Have a good one. Bye.